Hi there, and welcome to Inside the Wooniverse, a podcast brought to you from the corner of Fringe and Maine. I'm your host, Colette Baron reed And joining us today is the amazing, gifted, intuitive, medium, channeler, transformation teacher, musician, singer, like amazing singer, author, and my friend, Lee Harris. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lee before he says hello. In addition to his acclaimed live events, membership, community, and podcast, I want to talk about his music. Oh my goodness. He is an accomplished music producer and singer-songwriter whose albums have charted as high as number one on the iTunes and Amazon New Age charts. And his channeled books, Energy Speaks, Conversation with Disease, which I got to read before it got published. It was so good. Book one, The Energetics of the New Human Soul, run to get that book. And the book that is being released today is book number two in the same series, Awaken Your Multidimensional Soul. Now, they are nothing short of amazing, and I highly recommend them to anyone searching for spiritual solace and a good sense of humor, too, in these chaotic times, because his Zs are, they got, it, they got a thing going on. Welcome to the Wooniverse, Lee. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you. Yeah, it is. It is. It's just been such a wonderful friendship that's developed too since you and I connected and I respect and I love you so much. And it's just a, a real, I just feel so blessed to be able to do this the day your book launches. So yay us. Thank you. So I feel blessed and right back <laughs> at you. So we love a good backstory here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, we want to start when little Lee came on the scene. So what was your childhood like and when did you start sensing and connecting with unseen energies? Well, it, you know, I was born to uh, a loving family. So um, I have a brother and a sister who are eight and six and a half years older than me. And we moved from where I was born in Birmingham in the UK to when I was six years old, we moved just outside Windsor. So Apparently, according to my guides, I don't remember this, but they said until we moved, they were in regular contact with me. And then at that point, I forgot. But the one thing that was a thread all through my childhood, and I think was my saving grace, was creativity. So mm. since I was little, my family would all be watching TV, and I would be lying on the floor in the middle of the room, making something. So I'd half watch the TV, but like this compulsion to create and produce and make, which I now look back and go, oh my God, I was, you know, I still see that in me now. It's just a different, I guess. But where I think my sensitivity showed up mm -hmm. was I didn't know how to process feelings and I had a lot of them. I had like way more than was convenient for being, <laughs> for being a boy. I as totally well. And I, and I think from an early age, I got the feeling I was like, uh oh, I'm not heterosexual. I don't uh -huh. think it was until I was 12, uh, around 11 or 12, that I really knew that I was gay and attracted to mm -hmm. men. And of course, you know, I'm 46. So that was not the norm. Mm -hmm. And not that, and even now it's in the still terrible things going on around the world for people who aren't heterosexual. Mm -hmm. So it, it was it was an interesting time. And I basically developed a, a, a glorious eating disorder to cope with it all. And so, um, yeah, my, I think my memories of intuition when I'm a child are not strong, but yeah. I was dealing with the shadow side of being a highly sensitive kid. And the way I was dealing with that, not very helpfully, was with binge eating sugar. So I was taken to Weight Watchers at 10, I was in and out of diet clinics uh, all through my teens. I would lose the weight. They would give me pills or whatever they would give me. I'd lose it. I'd feel, you know, good for a while. And then it would mm -hmm. all just go back on and more because I hadn't gotten to the bottom of my own sense of unease at being a human in the world, even though I had, a, you know, a loving family and good experiences. I, I just felt like the odd one out. And so in my late teens, I started to recover. Mm. And I found a more creative, artistic expression in the college that I was sent to when I was 16. And wow. that was really when I started to kind of come back to myself. I started to get very into metaphysics, but I never in a million years, when I was going to all those workshops that I was going to, metaphysical workshops, personal development workshops, I would never, if you had said to me, you're going to end up doing do. this for work, I'd have gone... <laughs> No, no, no. There's only a few people who do that. And I kind of had them on a pedestal because to me, they were the gatekeepers to spirituality. 
Whereas, of course, wow. no one is the gatekeeper to spirituality. No, you know, that's kind of how not. we, that's how those of us, you know, 25 years ago were a little more of a mindset back then. So, yeah, I, I thought I was going to be a, a singer songwriter and take You're my, my brother. I know, this right? Like, I'm listening to you going, <laughs> what? Yes, <laughs> me too. Me too. I was 14 when I got bulimic. So, yeah, I get it. And the Play Doh. The play doh on the floor. I don't know. Did mm -hmm. you play with play doh in England? I, you yeah. know, that's that's the molding clay. I yeah. could even I can even smell it when you were telling me that. And I'd be there with the with the crayons and and the play doh or the or whatever I could build or dressing Barbies. Yeah, I used to <laughs> I used to force people Couture. who came around to our house to come and look at the latest thing that I'd built. And they were all very nice. Like you know, my parents were like, "Okay, Aww. come and look at this theater that Lee has built. Come and look at this." <laughs> <laughs> like I was always just building and creating things and, and that hasn't gone away. You know what I think people can really identify with is that oversensitivity. I mean, you and I both have it because, and, and we developed this extraordinarily porous boundaries where we could tune into more than we should, but we like in terms of the conditioned concept of what a human being is. Right. So mm -hmm. it, 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 we have this vast access, which I've had since I was a kid too. And I also didn't wake up going, oh, wow, how spiritual am I? It was horrible. Yeah. It was, I was different and I didn't belong. I never belonged. I was afraid. And food was my go to too. And, mm -hmm. and the up and the down and the whole thing, trying to control the world, mm -hmm. you know, with the binge eating. And it's devastating when you're growing up to feel like you have no control and depression that comes in and stuff. It is. And you know what, what I now look back on for that time? I don't know mm -hmm. if you relate to this, but because I was a child who was sizable, and then I would have periods where I'd lose the weight and then I'd gain the weight again. The thing, the thing it really taught me was how we as a society have really messed up value systems around mm -hmm. the way we treat people based on how they look. Yeah. Because I would meet strangers who would look at me one way when I was 70 pounds heavier. Yep. And the exact same strangers, if I met them two years later, would look at me an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. So the one thing I really took from that is I was like, wow, the, the, who we, who we are externally to some people to is some a people, big deal yeah. and it's all they mm -hmm. kind of go with. And I, I'm glad to see a lot of that being discussed and broken down yeah. now. That was Especially the music business. The oh, music yeah. business was, it just chewed me up and spit me out because there was so much pressure to look a certain way. When I see some of my album covers, I'm wearing a corset and the corset, yeah, it was funny because I thought it looked cool and I was very sexy and I was, you know, I was going to the gym five days a week to try to maintain my weight and the way I, you know, and I was never going to be skinny. I've got, you know, I'm curvy, yeah. but I was still quite, you know, buff back then, especially my early forties. But the, the lengths that I went, even holding my stomach in while I was singing. So I, I couldn't even sing with my diaphragm because I was so worried that I would look overweight hmm. because it was so drilled in. Like the music business for women is just for awful. Women, but I it's even horrendous. Right? I mean it was yeah anyway, huh? <laughs> like I always laugh now saying, oh I didn't make it in the music business because I I could never be younger or thinner <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> but it isn't it interesting because I, I I see it now and 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 I got to talk to India Ari on my podcast and it was fascinating to hear her describe not only was she in the black she was in the woman box, she was also in the black woman box. And there were yeah. only so many people of color that could get played in an hour. And there were only so many women who could get played oh. in an hour. So what I love about this period of history mm. is music creators are no longer having to go through those gatekeepers of the traditional music yeah. industry. They can just put their music out and be who they want to be. And even in the traditional music industry, we have people like Lizzo, who are rewriting I the script her. and it's just fantastic. <laughs> I have loved her since even before she was she's famous. Amazing. I was like, who is this person? No, she's very cool. Um, so I want to talk about the relationship between creativity and the channeling, because I find that when I'm painting, I'm channeling and you also paint. And when I'm writing music or when I'm singing, it, it's the same feeling as when I'm tuning in and I'm receiving information. Is that the same for you or how is it different? It is. And I love that you bring it up because, you know, a lot of people that I've met over the years who are a little mystified by, am I channeling? Is it intuition? I always mm. say, well, tell me about when you're creating something. And even the right. non the people who don't think they're creative, they go, well, I don't. And I'm like, I've 
been with you. You cook. You're an amazing cook. You go into your fridge and you figure things. I, I don't do that. So, <laughs> you know, creativity shows up in so many ways. And for me, it's when we go into this collaborative flow mm-hmm. and we're birthing something that maybe wasn't there before. And even the act of channeling, I always remind people when they say, well, how do I know I'm not making this up? And I go, you are. Because unless you're donked over the head and put in a trance against your will, you are you are agreeing to yes. tap into intuition and be a vessel for it. So, you and know, to I, translate it exactly, there is this collaboration. So for me, the creativity was very evident from a young age. But what's mm-hmm. so interesting to me is I didn't write music until I was twenty-one, and at the mm-hmm. time, I had spent my whole childhood as an actor, and I loved the shamanic process of acting. I love becoming a completely different person. Mm -hmm. It really appealed to the empath and the shaman in me. But I knew that acting was going to bore me. I knew that even though I was at drama school, I was like, this is, you know, this is going to be boring. And so I was already (laughs) directing and writing and really wanted to get more into the process. But at 21, I heard music. And for the Mm -hmm. first time ever, I, I would hear melodies in my head. I would hear whole songs. I would hear lyrics and to me this was like oh my god this is magic i'd loved music my whole life so i was like okay i'm going this way and the z's later told me that's my guides they said we got to you first through music we opened your music channel when you were 21 and then we opened the verbal channel with you at 23 and if those two things hadn't happened Mm -hmm. and it's so funny because i always hear music on the left hand side of my head when i hear it and I always hear my guides on the left hand side of my <gasps> Me head. Me too. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, that's just so weird that you said, I'm listening to you say that. It goes, what's he going to say now? <laughs> I'm like, that's exactly right. I hear it coming through here. And I actually always like to have somebody on that side of me. Like when I used to do readings in person years ago, um, you could never sit on my left. You always had to sit on my right because that's where I was getting the information from. Oh, and it was a lot easier to collaborate with the person's energy if they were there. Um, even though I preferred doing it on the phones, then I couldn't see the person's body language, et cetera. I had nothing to move on. I had to be completely clean. And then I would still get it from my right. I always put the phone on my left and I would tune into my right. And when I hear music, when I'm writing music, it always comes through my left side. Always. Wow. Always. Oh, it's like I, I pull it in. It's just wild. That's too funny. Isn't that funny? Okay. So let's talk about the life-changing moment you experienced in 1998. Yeah, something big happened. Yeah. So I was, at the time, I was, I just recorded um, my first album and was trying to get into the music industry with it unsuccessfully. And um, I was working in fundraising, which was a job I really enjoyed because it felt aligned with some of my values. You know, I was working for companies like Greenpeace and I thought, okay, great. This is, this is a good job. Did you do it on the phone? No, not at all. I did it on the street. Oh, wow. Knocking on doors. And that was, that was, (laughs) and, and we were actually, we were like one of the first companies, you know, when people are out there with clipboards Yep. and they come up to you and they speak to you about the charity and they're asking you if you will do a monthly donation. It was a friend of mine who said, look, I've just started working for this company. It's a new thing. I thought of you, would you like to do this? And I was working in a pub at the time and writing songs in the day. And I was like, okay. So anyway, the thing I always remember about that time was not only it was very interesting to be out on the street approaching people and noticing how the people who looked kind of cold and shut down, you'd go, oh, I'm not gonna ask them, but you'd do it and they would turn into the nicest people (laughs) <laughs> and then the people who would look friendly and hi everyone they would be like cold to you and like rude right. so that was very educational and I worked with brilliant people but I was on my way to work one day on the tube the London underground the subway and I was going through all my own usual self-doubt uh, negative self-talk all of that stuff and I was thinking about a relationship that I was in at the time uh, where I was convinced oh well that's their issue And I literally heard from the (laughs) left, that's an interesting idea, but you're wrong. And I was like, what? And it was just, it was clear (laughs) as day. And then I had a thought and they basically said, yes, we're your guides. And here's why you're wrong. And here's why it's your issue. And the answer they gave me not only blew my mind informationally because they were, as soon as they said it, I saw it. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, that is me. That's, that's how I'm contributing to this. But my whole 
aura, if I even knew what an aura was back then, I was literally like this on the subway, kind of, you know, in, in my energy field. And my energy field just started to open out with their presence. And I started to relax and become open. Mm. And so at first you think, is this at the time we called it schizophrenia? Now <laughs> it's uh, called multiple personality disorder. And I thought, is this schizophrenia? Oh my God, this could be schizophrenia. And then after about two days of talking to them every day and writing down the answers, I was like, well, if it is, I want to keep them because they're really useful. <laughs> like I got lucky. And they just explained, you know, we're your guides. We've been with you since you were little. Um, it's time for you to hear us. And so I went through a period of many, many months of couldn't wait to get home mm -hmm. and write out questions that were both personal, that would shift my personal life and that would help me see things in a more expansive way. And then also questions about earth, the universe, things that I was interested in. And because I had a few spiritual friends at the time, it didn't take long before I was giving readings to friends and, and word spread. And that was kind of how it all started. So do you hear them audit like as an auditory uh, uh, audit but is it inside your head or is it no, outside it's, it's outside it's above so when i'm it's above you them, it's above and to the left but when i'm channeling them through my body and they've explained this they come and sit somewhere between my third eye and my heart they don't go any lower because they shouldn't they said we you know we have to leave the rest of his body to him that's when i'm channeling but when mm -hmm. i'm being an intuitive which is I always think of it as a few rungs down the ladder. So if if my guides have this very cosmic overview where they're removed from the planet right. and they just kind of look at everything from above, when I'm being an energy intuitive, I position myself halfway in the middle. And that is a very feeling experience for me. Uh -huh. It is when I channel too, and they've said they use my feelings to track how the message is uh, landing with people. So. It's interesting. I will feel like a slight tightness in my body about something they're saying, and then they'll change course because the uh -huh. tightness in my body is the relay of how it's being received. So for me as an intuitive, even though words are a huge part of it, it's not like I'm repeating words I hear. I get into a zone where they just flow and mm -hmm. my feelings are doing a lot of the work for me, but kind of invisibly without me really tracking my own feelings or understanding mm -hmm. the process when I'm in it. Oh, that's so fascinating. I love this. Okay, so you, it's a collective. You have a collective they call disease. Yes, so they're called disease because I asked, I said, do you have names? And they said, well, we don't have names, but we know humans like names and need names, so we'll give you what our human names would be. They said, we don't have names like you have names. They said, I'm the lead spokesperson, and you can call me Zachary. And then a couple of years later, they explained they were a group and they said, we're 88 beings. And that really appealed to me because of the piano and the keys of the piano. Right? So, you know, 88, 88 has been like a lifelong number for me ever since then. And they said, but even though we're a collective of beings and we have some angelics here, we have several members who have been incarnate on the planet before, many never have. They said, we are not fixed and neither are you. So they said, yes, we're a group of 88 but we can mm -hmm. retrieve information from other sources. We're a, think of us as a consciousness library. And right. if we need to go out to other beings, other places to retrieve information that we centralize and then send to you, that's what we do. And they said, and don't think that you as a human are any different. They said, because you as a human are not an individual. You're this conglomerate of all your experiences, all your lives, mm -hmm. all the people who've touched you. So when they explained it that way, it made sense. And a few years after I'd been channeling, they two more spokespeople appeared called, who named themselves as Zyadora, uh, who said you would understand me as feminine energy to Zachary's masculine right. energy. And then Zafariah, who was a slightly edgy blend of the two and was very <laughs> challenging for me because she had like a personality, which <laughs> was not comfortable for me as a channeler at the time. But for about four or five years, I publicly would channel any one of these three, and I wouldn't even know who it was going to be sometimes before it started. And then they'd announce themselves, and they each had like different areas they covered. Mm -hmm. And so the audience for my work started calling them the Z's. The Z's. And th so I didn't name them, the, you know, the audience that, yeah. who listened did. So much easier to call them now, the Z's. Now they just speak with one voice. Back in about 2013, they said, we're now just going to have one voice again, because... 
it's not useful uh, with the period that you're in in history it's not useful for us to separate out it's actually more useful for you to understand we are one multi-dimensional consciousness with one voice but there's a lot here so i was like okay so that's how it's been oh i love it I love that. So um, you've channeled three books, Energy Speaks, Conversations with Disease, book one, which I loved. Um, the new book, book two, Waken Your Multidimensional Self. But the disease have been around for 20 years. And there's another book that you did also. Um, which, yes. which one is that? We, we actually, we are just about to finish book four, um, even though they'll, they'll be a bit delayed. But the book three will be in uh, 2024. And that's called Demystifying Reincarnation and Karma. Oh, I love that. Now, have you done all of them with a psychotherapist? Because I know you mm -hmm. did book one and two with both uh, Diana Edwards. Yes. And, and Diana is someone who I first met many, many years ago when she came to me as a client. And then we became friends. And I only asked her to do a few recordings with me. She had a, a passion. She has a passion around death, dying, and grief. Yes. And mm -hmm. so that's actually book four. And she said, would you ever do some recordings with me where I could speak to the Zs about these topics? And I said, sure. But first, would you mind doing something for my portal community? We do an audio every month. Could we just do some conversations? And that was it. That was all we were doing. And literally at the end of the first day, the first two 75 minute conversations, I went back to the guest house where I was staying when we were doing this work. And I literally heard, boom, these, <laughs> are, go these are going to be books. And I was like, huh? Because like, that was not the plan, nor was that, you know, people had been asking me about a book and I just went, no, there isn't a book. And boom. Right. They, it's they, a conversation. I like yeah. that. I really like the style of that. It reminded me also, I was really into the Seth books. Ah, Remember yeah. Jane Roberts? Yes. So that in this, I think she was early 1970s when she was yeah, channeling she was. Seth. That was the most brilliant content, brilliant body of work. So mm -hmm. I, I was very open. Um, well, you know, when it's real, it's real, right? Yours, yours is definitely real. I know it is. And I love that you have a psychotherapist doing that. It lended a little bit more of this kind of interactive credibility in a way of just like, here's the information. How interesting is that? And then there's this person who's able to kind of uh, translate it uh, her way too, you know, to give her her viewpoints on things. I thought was really interesting. Oh, brilliant. What's wonderful about Diana is she's very, she's a spiritual old soul. She's very spiritually read and learned. Mm -hmm. So she very much knows, uh, she knows the, her stuff. The world. But I yeah. love that because she's a psychotherapist, not only can she bring it back down to the earth, she can also infuse it with certain stuff around the patterns that we all carry, yeah, that we're all working I, on, which I love. Very helpful. I, I found it really, really, really rich. So it's, it's not a big book. Um, they're the they're relatively short. The second right. one is almost double the length. Yeah, the publisher wanted the first one to be that small. I was a little on the fence. No, it was but, perfect. Okay, good. Oh, no, <laughs> it was just because it was so much. There was It wasn't, it, it was small in pages, but rich and thick yeah. with ideas. No yeah. way. I, I think my head would have exploded if it was any bigger. Um, so you uh, regularly uh, talk about the concept of oneness. That's something that you talk about a lot. You reference it a lot. And uh, it's something that I also believe that I see it more as wholeness, oneness, wholeness, and, and interconnectivity. So can you tell us a little bit more about that viewpoint of oneness and why it's important for us to really consider that these days in these obviously chaotic times. Yes. So oneness was something that I as a human being had heard of many times. And I had friends who did oneness meditations. And, you know, I, I knew of that term, but I hadn't really investigated it myself. The Z's really started cranking up how much they <laughs> talked about it about six years ago. And the reason they talk about it is they say it, it it's it's the thread of connection between all of us. And if we were operating from a place of oneness with no sense of separation or division right. from other people, then most of what we see happening on the planet today just wouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. And so even though they say the earth is not living from a frequency of oneness at this point in history, right? and nor might it be in our lifetime, they say what you are doing is seeding that consciousness more and more on the earth. So they're very adamant. They say, by all means, keep your eye on what's going on in the world. And especially if you're an activist for a certain area 
or you're mm-hmm. someone who is a change maker for a certain area of injustice or a certain area of oppression, by all means, they said, however, never lose sight of the fact that light and consciousness on the earth cannot be killed. Your right. hope can, your belief yep. in a better future can, and they say there is a, there are a, a certain groups of people who right now want to scare human beings. Yeah, let's and, talk more about that. Yeah. I want to know what do they think is going on right now? I want give give me your d- disease take on our times. So they haven't been specific with the actual time that this took place, yeah. but they said over ten thousand years ago there was a frequency available on Earth that has since been clamped. Okay. So there was that frequency would mean that we as souls were more expressive, we were more intuitive, we were more we were able mm-hmm. to be a human soul, not a human. And they said that over time, our freedom, our power, and our soul self has been eradicated and discouraged from our cultural conditioning. And we're now at the point where some of the original groups who apparently seeded this clamp on earth Mm -hmm. still have operational... um, if you like representatives playing this out, not to sound <laughs> okay. too sci-fi, because I always struggle when I try and explain this to make it sound real. But I now I've heard them talk about this for so many years. I can see it. I can yeah. literally go, you oh, can. I see. I'm like, that's that's so evidently designed to terrify people. Yep. And and actually anything that's coming from the soul or the heart is never going to see terrifying people as anything good to do unless you want control Mm -hmm. or unless you want to control the future narrative. So, I mean, I don't need to say too much for us to talk about control in the last three years and what we have seen. Um, And so Mm -hmm. they say we're at this very tricky time in history where consciousness is rising, but that's also why we are seeing some of those agendas doubling down on their aims to limit progress. So it's a tumultuous time and it doesn't make it an easy time to live through. But they said it is the destiny path for Earth for this to break and that we are the generation where the break happens. So that's kind of a simplistic way of kind of giving an overview. And there's always a renaissance after this kind of, well, I mean, this is, this exact thing has never happened before, but it has happened before. We are cyclical yeah. people. We are, we are moving through yet again, another cycle of change and we're in a crisis point. And that crisis point means that there is an opportunity. So in every crisis is a turning point and the turning point and allows us to, di- you know, kind of see all these things fall apart so that we can rebuild it. And we're in the falling apart part Mm. (laughs) right? before the rebuilding. And hopefully we'll see it in our lifetime, but it's our job to show up for this, I think, and to recognize when, you know, there is a big doubling down. And and I do believe that there's, there are, you know, we're, we're influenced by the forces that of the energy that is very organized, you know, for and against, if you will. That's why there's so much polarization going now. So that's why we have to really focus on that light that we share, that we have the connections that we have with everybody, the oneness that you talk about and the Z's talk about, and that that wholeness where we where we don't see things through the eyes of scarcity and lack, et cetera. We look through it in the terms of what can we contribute? Where's our compassion, you know, our connections to each other. It's just a really interesting time to be alive, I think. It is. And one of the things the Z's have really mm-hmm. ingrained in me over the last 20 years, and they say this regularly, is they say, you never know when you're going to die. They say, yeah. you know, your your time will come and it could be tomorrow. And if you knew that tomorrow was your last day on earth, how would you spend today? And for me, what that has done is it's woken me up so many times. (laughs) Hang on a second. Yeah. Why am I slightly or half asleep at the wheel here? You know, it, it reminds me that these paths that were laid down for so many of us as kids, you'll get married, you'll have a good job, you'll get right. retired. You'll, oh, I'm like, boy. who made those paths? Like, the, yeah. you know, the, so, but I, I, like many of us were so conditioned into them that the deconditioning of that takes time. So that's one of the things they always remind me of. And they're very, very adamant that particularly for visionaries and sensitives, which I know will be yes. pretty much your whole audience, 
that it's so important that we are not co-opted during times like this yes. and that we only see a fearful path and that we right. only see a dead end path because they said, you're the ones creating the vision. And they did say one of the huge moments that we're in, and this can take you know a couple of decades mm -hmm. to play out, is the imbalance in the power structures on earth. You know, there are so many of us on earth and yet how many of us are actually allowed to influence power or the systems? And I right. think we're at this very interesting time where more people are beginning to see that gridlock and go, oh, hang on a second. I thought I had some influence here. So it, it, I think we're very much at the beginning of it. So it's edgy, but it's it's important. And it's it's that that revolutionary change is needed. And don't you think too, with the advent of social media and all these there, it's just a big distraction. It's like you people, you look over there, look in your machines while we get busy over here. It's yes. a very, you know, I think about that sometimes like, oh my goodness, like how, how are we being controlled by all this information? And we really do need to uh, empower ourselves to make decisions about how much we're willing to be um, in, influenced by what we see. Um, right. It's like what we, what we take in. I think there has to be boundaries around what we take in so that we can make our decisions coming from a place of, of wholeness rather than reactivity and fear. So sensitives don't get co-opted by the fear because they're like, Oh my God, the sky is falling chicken little, you so, know, and so I, true. who can I help? Cause we only focus on the suffering. Like how do I help those who are suffering? But and that's all you end up seeing. It's all you see. That's tricky. And it, and it's interesting because I think a friend of mine, you know, always uses the word discernment. Like we need to be yes. taught to discern what's for us and what isn't because I guess the positive side of social media and the technology we have now is, yeah, the shadow side is we're more informed than is probably good for our nervous systems. And the way we're informed can be very controlled and manipulated, as you said. Yes. But there is also the other side. The of connections. It. The connections. My, the yeah, visibility. both of us. Like I yeah. think of, you know, when we were going through everything um, a few years ago where yet again, racial injustice and inequality was up in people's mm -hmm. awareness. I think, wow, people can film things now. Yes. and show us what's going on. Whereas 20, 30 years ago, they couldn't. that narrative could be no. controlled by a newspaper and now certain things. So it's a very interesting, chaotic, the internet is, is, is the kind of perfect metaphor for our world. There's the good, yeah. the bad and the ugly. Yeah, the good, right. And there is good. There really is good too. There is. But it's, I think really what I was suggesting too was the fact that our nervous system just can't cope with the amount of information, good mm -hmm. or bad. It wasn't even about, yeah. you know, how we're influenced. It's we can't, we, we don't have the electrical equipment. It, it, right? It's just not downloaded yet. We have to have time in order to process all the information that we're being exposed to. And I just think it's, it's mind boggling and it can be, it can really take its toll on you, on your energetic system. So you have to have, like, go out in nature, get off the internet, you know, go for a walk, read a book, something where you're not, um, you're not being bombarded with pictures and images, et cetera, that are so quick where you lose your capacity to focus. That's the other thing. People have, you know, I think it's really impacted our ability to stay focused on anything. You know, it's yeah. so it's like we're like gnats now. Like, yes. <laughs> it, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't get the TikTok thing, even oh, though I know man. that my team. We have to do it. There. I know what you mean. We have but to do that. I literally, if, and, and I trust I me, can't I, do it. I, I'm, I'm, I can be a fairly speedy person. I love coffee. TikTok just spins me out. I'm like, I, I try, and I love cat videos. So that's how someone got I me. I like on there. otter videos. I, I watch otter want, videos. <laughs> so fast and it's like boom and I'm like oh you know I and, and, and I'm you know I'm pretty good with speed normally so and and then there are people I know who just love TikTok so I know I like I don't I know world. it's just I don't know I just I, I like learning I I don't I just I just can't it's to me it's a time sucker I don't know, I know um so mean. let me ask you some things about the Z's because they they talk about the magnetics of manifestation and I think when times are chaotic people get scared that they won't be able to create their reality or co-create because they think that they their lives are being co-opted by the chaos, right? Mm -hmm. That's everybody, not just sensitive people. Mm -hmm. So what, what do the Z's say about manifesting and co-creating during chaotic times? Well, interestingly, they would say it's a great time to do it. So Me I think, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it too. I agree. They'd say the challenge will be 
not losing your visionary power because you're so distracted or mm -hmm. so buying into the doom and gloom scenarios that are uh, very uh, attractive to us on a base level. It's why sure. clickbait is it, the, those headings on clickbait. There's a podcast I have watched and I really enjoy the podcast and it's very intelligent and very quite deep. And just the other day, I saw the way they had titled one of their clips and I was like, wow, they're they're really going for like TMZ style headlines here. Right. And that's not representative of the show, but clearly someone on their team has decided, decided. that's how you get people to click. So there is uh, something in our wiring that yeah. we will be very responsive in our base chakra to, to the negative bias, drama, horror, yeah. sex, kind of all those kind of base energies. So the Zs will say your first job in chaotic times is to not allow yourself to get drawn into the chaos. Right. But they will say the second thing is it, it's, it's a time where the lack of control means you can create things in the liminal spaces in between the chaos yeah. that, that may not otherwise exist. And I think that's why we often talk as a society. You mentioned earlier about how cyclical we are. Great art has always yeah. come out during These, during difficult times, and usually yeah. a year or two after really difficult times, incredible art comes out. And to me, art is creativity; it's yep. manifestation made real. So I think it's the same with our lives. And they talk about how we are moving towards the fifth dimension being more of the norm. They were just saying that from 2030 onwards, most of us our baseline will be the fifth dimension. And sure, we'll drop down to the fourth and the third and we'll go higher. What do you mean by that? I'll, I'll explain yeah, it. Okay. I, used to, I used to really dislike that term because I just found it jargony and confusing. <laughs> but they have started talking about it more. And they said, the fifth dimension is not like five floors above you. It's actually vertical and you can mm -hmm. move into it. And they say, you are in the fifth dimension when you are in synchronicity when you are in flow, when you're thinking about something and you see a sign, right that there. Mm -hmm. backs up, or you're being creative, or you're very heartfelt with a friend and you're, you're in what they would call the oneness energy. You are mm -hmm. tapping into the magic of life, the heart of life. You're feeling alive. You're feeling present. They say that is fifth dimensional reality. And they say that's not sustained on earth right now. Some people do. But they say that those of us who are already, if you like, working on becoming more conscious and opening mm -hmm. our consciousness that will be more the norm for for, for us in that group from 2030 onwards and that's only said, seven years isn't it it's seven only years seven ago. years and then mm -hmm. they also said that then that that lifts everybody else and they're mm -hmm. very quick to uh kill any ideas that anyone ever has that they're special you know they'll say <laughs> there are a group of you that are here to seed consciousness doesn't make you better than all of the other people on the planet whose job isn't that, but whose job might be serving your life and your existence. And I'm very clear about that, but they said it's 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 a really important role that many have on the planet right now. And it doesn't mean you have to be like you, Colette, out there doing your work or me. Or you. mm -hmm. You'll be in I your community. It. You'll be the yeah. one who is safe for people. You'll be the one creating the community garden. You'll be the one that your friends can talk to about feelings. You know. So we're, we're everywhere, apparently, but that's where we're moving, the fifth, more of a fifth dimensional reality. And when they broke down some of the qualities, I was like, okay, I'll go with this fifth dimensional thing. Yeah, yeah, because I do. Sometimes people say the fifth dimension, meaning that they're, you're going to escape reality, basically. Whenever I hear that they talk about ascension, I get like, ah! Because yeah. it's like, we have to bring that user friendly right here because we are here on this earth planet touching things, etc. You know, we can't escape yeah. what is, but that isn't escapism at all. That's actually being more in sync with the, with really what I call the divine matrix or Greg Braden called it the divine matrix that, mm -hmm. you know, that where everything sinks in. And, and we've had many experiences like that. Many, anybody who's had a synchronistic experience and, you know, and fosters it through intentional synchronicity, there's ways we can do that. It's, it's just kind of like going to the gym. Them. But it doesn't make us better 100%. It just makes us more aware and uh, quicker to create things and co-create things and more awe, I think. Now, can I quickly throw yes. something in? Colette? Yes. You said something really important that it took me years to kind of figure this out, the escapism part. 
Yeah. So I think, you know, what I came to understand after years of working with clients and reflecting back on my own journey as a as a spiritual newbie in my late yeah. teens, I guess, the escapism thing is so interesting because what tends to happen for many of us when we first have an awakening or a spiritual experience or a psychic experience, or we we have a workshop that makes us feel completely different about life. It's like an opening and it's an awakening moment. And I always equate it to the beginning of a romance. You know, you have all those chemicals running through your body and everything's amazing. And then at some point it's going to settle down and you get to integrate with that person who you are, who they are. But at the beginning, there can be this, oh my God, all the lights went on. So I've witnessed two different ways that people play that. There are those of us who, when the lights first went on for us, it's like, oh my God, I've missed this. This is home. Yeah. And we want to we, we stay there for a while or we keep then hunting that. Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. eventually we go, oh, I see. I'm supposed to be both. I'm supposed to be human and soul. Both and my and. work is yeah. integrating the two. And then equally, I've seen a lot of people who haven't yet dealt with perhaps their trauma Mm -hmm. or what they've been through as a sensitive, keep trying to get back to spirit, you know, and they're the people who you will see do workshop after workshop. For the ascension experience. Yes. But not necessarily, they either don't have the support in their life or the people in their life that can help them look at some rewiring some of their patterns so that they can let more of that light in on a daily basis. So I love that you brought up Escape or they think they can just like erase it right away. Boom. That's Go to a workshop other, and it goes away. And that's the, not true. It's the other side. And you you do see that mm-hmm. sometimes with, you know, newer spiritual teachers who are out there Telling promising you, things that we you think, can, that's yeah, gonna, that's we can erase all years. your pain. Yeah. No, you can't. Yeah, no. I've been around so, at this 35 years and you can't do that. No. Yeah. <laughs> so give them their money back. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I think you have to really do the work. I think you can't integrate the the work and become this new person or become a person uh, that is no longer run by the traumas, run because they, they can run our lives. They can. It takes work. I don't care what anybody says. You can't wiggle your nose and hypnotize yourself out of it. You just can't. Because then you aren't you aren't earning, I guess, somehow, how do I say this? You aren't you aren't bringing awareness to it, where you can integrate the experience, where you know the difference between the two. Like there has to be, you can't jump. The, there has to be a bridge you walk across, and every step counts. And then you can really own this side. Like you do the work. Like I'm a different person than I was when I was, you know, what thirty five years ago when I started doing this. Thirty seven years clean and sober. I am not the same person. Mm. I am a different person. Mm. But it took work to get here. It took integration. And you cannot, if you're going to skip a step, you're not going to integrate it. And be easy for you to get triggered again. The layers of the onion, like that's really Mm -hmm. what, you know, I I hear you. It's like one of the things I've learned now 30 years into my journey as a student of consciousness and spirituality is it's kind of beautiful that new layers emerge all the time. Mm -hmm. These have been very helpful with me as someone who was very hard on myself in my 20s, they always say, celebrate it. Like if you see a pattern in yourself, don't judge it because you'll just put the lid back on it. Celebrate the fact you're seeing it. That means there's a layer coming off. That means there's some some work you can do around it. It's a, Awareness is the biggest gift. But so often there is this kind of belief of, oh my God, I thought I'd got rid of my Uh, my feelings of rejection. No, you didn't. (laughs) There you go. There's a microcosmic example of that rejection wound again that's showing up in your life. And if each time it shows up, you love love it through yourself and Mm -hmm. love your way through that process, then what you're describing becomes the journey. And that's great. I mean, I I don't always I don't always love it. I, no, I'd I love to skip to a few befriend, steps. <laughs> I've learned to befriend discomfort more than I ever used to be able to. But but now I do have a different awareness when I'm going through something than I than I could have had a decade or fifteen years ago. Yeah, it's like sitting on the ledge watching it while you're doing it. Right there's this kind of split consciousness. We're going, oh, here is the pattern again. Oh, that's interesting. Look at what we're doing. Well, we've done this before. Ah, well, maybe we could choose to do something a little bit different this time, you know, so they're just a little bit different and a little bit more different. And then eventually you just do it differently. So it's, it, it, I think the awareness is really crucial and key for us to have humility too, I think, Mm. because if we could just snap our fingers, then like, 
You know what I mean? There's I and do. there's also also some of the best art comes from some of our deepest wounds. You know, there's I love melancholy music, for mm -hmm. example, Me right? Too. Music where you let longing and yearning, those fifths and sevenths and fourths and you know <laughs> the tension in music that comes from that sense of poignancy of um, pathos of being human and being a spirit in human form and everything that goes along with that. And the willingness to have, um, I think it was John Kabat-Zinn that said the full catastrophe of life, all right. of it, right? All of it and going through the, the experience. Um, you know, if you have trauma, like be willing. I mean, I, I believe in getting help for trauma, um, you know, and, and I've had a lot of help and even 64 years of age, I still was doing some trauma work around something happened when I was 19. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Oh, this thing has come back again. And I wonder why, and this will be good. So you just get to what you get to when you can and when you can. Um, but I do think trying to just erase it and jump to a fifth, a, another dimension of consciousness where you don't have to do the work just isn't going to happen. No, and that's often called the bypass as well, isn't it? Yes. The spiritual bypass. But <laughs> yes. What you just said is so is so is so true, and it makes me remember something the Z's helped me understand, which is they said, as humans, we tend to overpersonalize our own issues. Right. They say that rejection that you are clinging on so tightly, as if it's a part of your identity, you have absorbed part of the energy of rejection that lives on this planet. And you, right. it's an energy system. And so as we clean it up in ourselves, we become the formula of cleaning it up for others. Right. So they said, you're not just here to clear your wounds. You're here to clear the wounded energy template on the planet as you go through it. So right. it's a really interesting other way of looking at it. And I love what you said about split consciousness, because that's, that's how you can withstand it. When mm -hmm. you do have a slightly wider view and isn't that the beauty of aging? Because you go through enough yeah. things that you start yeah. to go, okay, I've I've been in this awful place before and I remember yeah. that it passes yeah. or it changes. There is something about holding that space. And that for me was who the Zs were before I learned to um, hold more of an awareness space for and around myself. And isn't it amazing how we are meaning makers? I mean, that's what human beings are. We make meaning, mm -hmm. you know? So we say, what am I making this mean? And what else could this mean? Mm -hmm. If this didn't mean that, what else could it mean something else? You know, and, and being able to play with that a little bit too, to say, you know, especially when you talk about wearing, not, not taking the world personally, one of the statements that they said all the time in 12-step programs were, um, wear the world as a loose garment. You know, That's you know, great. around your shoulders, wear it loosely around your shoulders. It's not, it's, 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 we move through the world and we wear it loosely. We live in it, but we're not of it, mm -hmm. right? We live in it, we move through it, but we don't need to be of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that can help too. But I do think sometimes it comes with maturity and come with the, the willingness to really dive into all of it and be as human as we can with all the, I think, flossomeness. <laughs> yeah. Flaws that are awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting. I just went through a personal experience in the last couple of months where mm -hmm. I recognized that my old pattern around it would have been straight into flight. Yes. And I remembered times when I had used flight to change the situation. And what was great was I could, I could feel that history in my body, but I also could track enough in my own reaction to the process and the process that was happening and just, just kind of wait and kind of just look at it and go, oh, this is interesting. Oh, and, and, and literally like actively rewiring it by not just following the old pattern or the old right. path. So for me, it's been an interesting, both understanding how patterns and energies work and also, and this is what you're attesting to, know thyself. Know like, thyself. Like, know, okay, I'm pretty good at this. Oh, I'm not great at this. Or this scares me. Or I've always had a history of feeling uncomfortable when X happens. Mm -hmm. So like knowing when you're in a sensitive area to give yourself a bit more extra love and a bit more extra care. Um, yeah, because we're not often, I, I certainly didn't grow up being taught that stuff. I had to go and study it and find it by myself outside traditional educational systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, me too. I could talk to you forever. 
Um, do you t still talk to the Z's very often or do you, do they just kind of come when they want? They come when they want about six times a year and they, oh. they, they kind of warn me about things, which is very interesting and sometimes horribly inconvenient. <laughs> um, I remember being, um, you know, I moved from England to Colorado in 2012 and I was working on moving to Colorado for about two years. So I had a relationship with Boulder, Colorado from 2010 oh. to 2015 when I left there for California. And I remember hiking. I love Boulder. The, oh, I love it. I was just there actually last week. I love it so much. And I was hiking on the foothill in 2014, early 2014, minding my own business. And literally I heard, you're leaving Boulder. You need to go to California. Prepare. <laughs> and I was grief stricken. I was yeah. grief stricken. I yeah. was, I, you know, and it, it, it's so funny because it took me eight months to unpick that message and to feel the truth of that message. Because I have a policy that I don't act on a message mm -hmm. that I'm given unless I, unless I can fully feel it in my body. I, yeah. I did that a few times, and it was like, yeah. uh oh, never jump out of the plane without the parachute just because the spirit guide told you to. Like, <laughs> no, 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 I don't play that game. So, so they were right though. <laughs> They were right that I needed mm -hmm. to leave. And so they will preface certain things to me or they will, they usually come in to prepare me for something that mm -hmm. might be months and months away. Um, but I speak to them as often as I want. And I also choose not to. I've, you know, something I've been dealing with in the last kind of six weeks mm -hmm. in my personal life, mm -hmm. I only spoke to them about it 10 days ago. Because right. I wanted to learn. I'm like, no, I don't want I don't want to hear what they have to say. I'm gonna mm -hmm. learn, I'm gonna track this. Uh, there's a lot moving through me around this. I, I need to be here, mm -hmm. not here. And of course, by the time I did feel to channel, it was very useful and very helpful. But mm -hmm. yeah. So Right. I love that. Love that. Okay, let's pull a card together and see if there's anything else that the Wooniverse or the Zs want us to talk about. Is that good? We're going to use yes. Wisdom of the Oracle. By the like way, that. Colette, can I just say, because you yes. and I have got to be friends over the last year or so, which has been a delight, but I remember you to me were a box of Oracle cards, like for the longest time, like that's <laughs> how I knew the name Colette Baron Reed is like, oh, the Oracle card lady. So this is a, a gorgeous <laughs> full circle moment to have you pulling a card. Because oh, for I a love long it. time, I thought you were a box of cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Uh, 15 boxes of cards now with, with the friend. Dreamweavers Oracle and then 16 coming. The 16th is my own art coming next year. So. Which, by the way, is spectacular. Thank I can't you. wait for you to be putting your own artwork out. And speaking of, you said earlier, you know, we're meaning makers as human beings. Yeah. That's what, you know, I knew you as a meaning maker before I knew you as a person or, or had even seen you on video. It's like, oh, you were making the meaning of Oracle cards manifest in our in our world. You were one of the people bringing meaning and, and grounded reality to this work. So thank uh, you for that. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just pick and this will reflect a topic that would be useful for us to bring to light deep knowing, mm. deep knowing. Mm. So for me, deep knowing is about our intuition, our inner teacher guide, that knowing that we don't need to look outside of us for answers, that what we need is to listen deeply. What do you think? I, I will add to what you said that the Zs would say that's what we're reclaiming. Yeah. Because we have been so externalized in the way we have been trained to be Yep. That they would say that the soul that's inside each and every one of us needs us to come back in and sit with it yes. and feel it and hear it and know it. So to it's me, it's our that, primary self. Completely. And we're like, the little part of us is running around, like, you know, this is what the world is. When meanwhile, this extraordinary self, this ancient self, this self that's chose to be here with us as its vehicle is just there waiting mm. for us to listen to it. And we're just, we're making so much noise in our heads. We don't hear it, but mm. we can. And when we do, and when we tap in, that's what the Oracle cards are for really too, is to help us tap into that primary self. When we realize our, our genuine primary reality is spirit, our genuine primary 
relationship is with spirit and and our first self with a capital S is the soul. It's not the personality at all. That's always a big shocker when you get there. Okay, we're going to switch gears now and travel into another dimension of the Wooniverse called the <laughs> Tea Time After Party. A place where we are going to kick up the fun. Not that we didn't have fun. I could talk to you for hours. You're so interesting and oh, love it. Joining us now. Executive producer Connie Deledi. Hey, Connie. Hi, Connie. Hi. Oh my gosh, I was just eavesdropping into your conversation. So <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? So well, it's my job. I wasn't eavesdropping, but yeah, it was uh, abso- <laughs> not a job. job. <laughs> it's like my passion. Seriously, it's like what? No, it was so brilliant and amazing, and like it was so <laughs> amazing. I'm so lucky, anyways, to be here with you both. All right. Um, why don't you ask the first question? Sure. Okay, Lee, what is the weirdest dream you've ever had? (sighs) It was a daydream and it was a recurring daydream. We are all in a black warehouse. So the rooms that we are all in right now, we're seeing things in color and with certain light on them, but, but they're not. Everything is black. We are programmed to see color and to see gradients of light in each mm-hmm. in each thing that we're looking at. Mm-hmm. And aliens are at the top of the warehouse watching us all. <laughs> well, oh, I don't know how. <laughs> I'm like, is that even like, weird? That's very that's universal. That's not weird. I kind of think <laughs> that's I've true. I've wondered about that many times. I'm like, wow, like, I, had that, okay. I had that recurring daydream a lot like, when I was a kid. <laughs> I'm that's, like maybe, maybe it was an abduction experience that I just don't remember. Like I've, mm. I've I've thought it was a daydream, but actually I was wow. on the ship in the black yeah. warehouse. Who knows? That's oh, amazing. that's freaky because I, yeah. I I real I I can tell you about some of the weird <laughs> stuff that's happened to me when I was a kid. Oh, never mind. I won't go there. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, <laughs> not going there. Not going there. <laughs> okay, so if you could trade lives with one person for one day, who would you choose and why? One person, one day. We'll edit to silence. (laughs) (laughs) Take your time, though. Take your time. Okay. I know who it would be. It would be Kate Bush. (gasps) Oh, that's my pick. No. You well, can't have her. We're, we're kind of That's a, what I want. No, you can have her on different days, guys. Okay, yeah. because she's, she's a true introvert and a creative genius. I would yeah. trade places with her for one day so mm. that I could find out how far she was with the progress of her latest album, which we have been waiting 11 years yes. for, so that I could know exactly what progress it was at and when it's coming and that I could hear oh, some wow. of it. Oh, yeah. You know, my greatest disappointment in my entire life came when it was actually my biggest letdown was when the president of EMI, God bless him, Dean Cameron, who's now crossed over he, of EMI Canada, told me he, because I was signed to EMI, um, yeah. and uh, he told me that he was going to send me to the UK as a present wow. to read for Kate Bush. Oh. And I was like... No, kid. that to me what meant more than recording an album. Meant I like I am not kidding you. Then he arranged it and said, "Oh, she's so shy and she's got a cold. You can't go." She influenced my music so much, so I love her so much. But anyway, yeah, Kate Bush. Well, you can have her, but that's well, if mine. ever that would... if ever that reading <laughs> offer comes back, if she gets over her cold and her shyness, <laughs> that's uh, like so many years can, ago. That's twenty years. Me, you can bring me along as your assistant. And I'll carry your bag. And Assistant make Chandler. I will be horribly behaved. <laughs> I, 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 so I would have to stay like, oh such an intervention on myself. I'm like, oh my God, I you know, <laughs> behave. Don't harass her. Don't stare at her. Don't stroke her hair. No. When, don't stroke her hair. Oh my, <laughs> oh my God. God. That's, that's so funny. <laughs> oh. I know when running up that hill came back, I mean, that was just oh, yeah. amazing. When it came when, so recently, when all these yeah. kids are starting to listen to her music, it's just. Her yeah. biggest hit in her career, 37 years later, when she's in her 60s. I live for that kind of stuff. Um, if you could live inside a TV show or a movie, which one would you choose? Ooh. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you mine. It's Bewitched. Yeah. Bewitched. <laughs> or I Dream of Janie. Either one of those. <laughs> but probably Bewitched. It's a good one. They're both good. You know, I, I it would probably be one of my comfort shows like Shits Creek or The Golden Girls. Yeah. <laughs> the Golden Girls, you know? yes. 
<laughs> they're, they're the kinds yes. of shows. They're like a nice, safe place to go Shit's with Creek. great heart energy yes. and humor. But prob- <laughs> probably Shit's Creek because the Golden Girls, you'd be very much, you'd be, you'd really stick out in that living room. <laughs> yeah, but stick out in the in living room. Shit's Creek, you can walk around the town, and and I just want to follow Moira Rose and see what she's wearing. Oh that my day god! Yeah, behavior she's up to. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So funny. Um, if you could be wildly successful in another profession, mm-hmm. what would you choose? <gasps> Easy. I would yeah. be a modern classical pianist. <gasps> okay. Oh, yeah. that is, you that, have that, that, that one in your pocket. <laughs> I know. And I keep telling myself, Lee, if you really put your mind to it, you could learn mm-hmm. the piano, but I don't. So I just instead mm-hmm. go and worship at the altar of people like Ludovico Einaudi. I got to see him at the Greek mm-hmm. theater last year. Oh, nice. Oh, my God. And, and so to me what they are able to conduct through their body mm. is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And like that, that's my fantasy other career, modern classical yeah. pianist, yeah. like him or Niels Fram or um, mm-hmm. Oliver Arnold's, all mm-hmm. those people. I love them. Oh, amazing. Oh, I love it. Okay. Last question. What is the most ridiculous thing you've done for love? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's the first thing that came to my head. Um, I had a relationship and it was my final go with the empath narcissist dynamic that I had attracted into my life multiple times. And, um, Mm -hmm. this one (laughs) who I hadn't known for more than a few weeks sold me a really good story about why he needed a business class plane ticket for his (laughs) next polo match. Oh boy. Because he was a polo player. And I, at the time, had managed to save $8,000 to my name, which I was saving for a house deposit. Uh And I gave him $4,000 and I made all the calls for these plane, for this ticket. It took me hours. And this wasn't that long ago. This was like eight years ago, um, nine years ago. And um, it was my final lesson around, Mm. can you really do that? Because, of course, I never got the money back. And, of course, uh, he disappeared. And... and, uh, and, and it, it, so, so that's not like a joyous. <laughs> it's a good story, it, though. It was a, a great story. learning. It was like, wow, mm-hmm. you just gave someone half your savings. You could have flown him economy if you'd really paid attention, you know. But no, no, he had to go business. <laughs> so I, I just remember my friend afterwards. I was going, but he, he, he had, he was, you know, he had this lovely house and he was rich. And she went, Lee he didn't have any money. Otherwise, <laughs> why is he hitting you? And I'm like, oh yeah. So it was, it was my last dance with naivete and then you know a year later i met Stephen after doing a bit more therapeutic work on myself yes i had to do lots of therapy (laughs) since i had so many frogs that i kissed but i was the one kissing them (laughs) it was i was the the when you wake up and realize you are the common denominator that is always a giant shocking awakening Anyway, to learn more about Lee, what a great conversation and all of his offerings, you can visit him at LeeHarrisEnergy.com. Go to his YouTube channel. What is that? It's just Lee Harris on YouTube. Lee Harris Energy. And then um, for the music, we have LeeHarrisMusic.com or on YouTube, it's Lee Harris Music. Oh, it's beautiful too. He's got some great new videos there. It's just wonderful. And as always, you can find a transcript of this episode, quotes, all the links and so much more on our show notes page. So go to ITWpodcast.com or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lee. We love Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. This was so much fun. Thank you, guys. So what did we learn today? Well, you know, listening to Lee Harris and him talk about the Z's that he channels, he's the real deal. I mean, I've watched him so many times. Before we became friends, actually, um, I watched his videos and I always found his A, his information spot on, and B, um, him not trying to... You know, like sometimes you see channelers where there's this big pomp and circumstance around it, and he's just very matter of fact. I like that. Um, And it's helpful information. Um, So I think I've learned that, you know, we really do have to trust when we hear, and it's always going to be for the betterment of humanity, the voices that we hear, that inner, that still small voice within. All of us have that, the voice of the soul. Not all of us are going to channel disease. I you know, we don't have to, we have Lee, we have Lee to watch on YouTube. So until next time, I'm Colette Baron reed Be well. Mm-hmm.